1959, tens of thousands of Tibetans trekked across the mighty Himalayas, emerging from centuries of isolation into a world completely new to them. Among the thousands fleeing their homeland was 49-year-old Dilgo Kyenze Rinpoche, one of the greatest Tibetan lamas of the last century. After traveling on foot for many months, Rinpoche and his entourage reached Bhutan, the last of the Himalayan Buddhist kingdoms. Like the other Tibetans fleeing at that time, Rinpoche had lost everything. Chenzhenbuchi, one of my important guru, and since now quite some time, as I received um, so many teachings, many important teachings, especially the the teaching of the realization or the experience of Jigpa. And since um, my first meeting with him, I got very good impression. Then through my this is some mysterious experience, including like you say, the dream, there are some clear indication that uh, there's some I think, I think a special karmic relation. With him, it seems there. So now, uh, today, I feel mm, very, very grateful to him and very, very helpful. Kense Rinpoche was born in the Dilgo family in the year 1910 in the valley of Denkok, eastern Tibet. His father, the governor of the Derge district, was overjoyed. His two other sons had joined the monastery, but now he had an heir to continue his work. In a hermitage behind the Dilgo estate lived Mipam Rinpoche, one of the most influential and revered scholars of the time. He gave the baby the name Tashi Paljor, auspicious glory, and promised throughout all his future lives to take care of him. Many Buddhist masters advised that Tashi Paljor should enter the spiritual path. I'm not going to let him become a monk, his father insisted, who would manage the family's estate and lands. One day, while playing with his brother, Tashi Paljor fell into a pot of boiling soup. His lower body was badly burnt, and he was bedridden for many months. Without any real signs of improvement, the parents lost hope for their son's life. Helplessly, the father asked his son, what should we do? Well, it would help 
If I could wear a monk's robe, the son replied. With a heavy heart, the father agreed. Tashi Peljor's entrance into the monastic life meant the end of the Dilgo family line. But the boy's health improved and he was happy. The young boy received his novice ordination from Kempo Shenga, a well-known Buddhist teacher from Eastern Tibet. During the ceremony, he was given the monastic name Rabsel Dawa, Brilliant Moon. Known for his ability to comprehend even the most complex Buddhist philosophies, upon returning from his studies for a brief winter break, the nine-year-old taught his mother the text, The Way of the Bodhisattva. At 14, the boy traveled to the great monastery of Shechen, where Shechen Gyaltsab, a well-known meditation master, bestowed on him the highest of all the Buddhist teachings, the introduction to the true nature of his mind. He later wrote, It transformed my perception and made me wish to give up all mundane concerns of this life and stay in solitude like my precious master to realize the great perfection. Over the next few years, the Dilgo son stayed in a cabin next to his teacher's hermitage. It was here that the young boy was officially recognized as the reincarnation of the great 19th century Buddhist master, Jamyang Kyentse Wangpo. From that day onwards, the young Dilgo son was known as Kyentse Rinpoche, the precious emanation of Kyentse. In 1926, while traveling in eastern Tibet, Kensei Rinpoche received a letter from his father, notifying him that Chechen Gyaltsab had passed away. Feeling as if his heart had been torn from his chest, the 18-year-old wrote, Alas, qualified master, though I followed you, the Buddha, in person, I haven't come to a true understanding about the instructions. How can you leave me behind like an abandoned orphan? Losing his beloved teacher deepened Kense Rinpoche's understanding of the impermanent nature of all things. He wrote to his parents, you gave me birth with all the freedoms and advantages of human life. And you have cared for me with love from my infancy till now. Since you introduced me to an authentic teacher, it is thanks to your kindness that I have encountered the path of liberation. For the next 13 years, Kyense Rinpoche isolated himself in the caves of eastern Tibet. The only visitor he saw was his older brother, who would occasionally visit with provisions. A cuckoo near his cave served as his alarm clock. As soon as he heard it, Around three in the morning, he would get up and start a session of meditation. After hearing, thinking about, and meditating on the life of my perfect teacher, I have resolved to slip quietly away from all this life's concerns and head for the wilderness of overhanging cliffs alone. Winters in Tibet were harsh, with snow accompanied by icy wind. However, day and night, he wore only a thin white cloth. Through his practice of tumo, 
he and his cave would remain warm with the snow at its mouth melting slowly. Although for now, your son will hide away in mountain glens, your smiling faces will be with me always. And if I reach the citadel of experience and realization, I shall repay your kindness. Of that you can be sure. The next many years were spent with Kensei Chokilodro, a non-sectarian master from the Zongsar Valley. Though Kensei Rinpoche had always desired to be a monk, at Choki Lodro's suggestion, in 1934, he took Kandro Lamo, a local villager's daughter, as his life companion. Over the next few years, Kandro Lamo gave birth to two daughters, Chime and Dechen. I was very young, and Rinpoche always goes for retreat. And we can see only uh, once or twice in a month, uh, not more than that, that I remember. Then he used to send us to collect some flowers and he offered mandala. And then his whole day he stays in the cave, so we are not allowed to see him. Sometimes we reach your food outside the cave and then go back. He hardly comes home, he only sees the retreat. When I was very young, I never knew he is my father. We thought it's my guru, and I never knew he's my father. All of Kensei Rinpoche's teachers had advised him that after properly engaging in study, contemplation, and meditation, he should then uphold, preserve, and expound the doctrine to the faithful. Despite Kensei Rinpoche's profound wish to spend his life in secluded retreat, he honored the advice of his teachers. He traveled widely across eastern and central Tibet, teaching as well as receiving teachings from various traditions. At Kensei Choki Lodro's behest, Kensei Rinpoche traveled to Rekong in northeast Tibet. There, he taught the great treasury of precious revealed teachings to nearly 2,000 yogis. It was the start of Kensei Rinpoche's selfless dedication in making the Dharma available to those who are interested. This commitment lasted until the end of his life. At the invitation of one of Tibet's great spiritual leaders, the 16th Karmapa, Kensei Rinpoche journeyed to Surfu in central Tibet, where he gave empowerments and teachings. While there, news arrived of the Chinese Red Army's occupation of Tibet's capital, Lhasa. Everyone who had come to Lhasa was being arrested. Some were forced to leave their children behind. Some jumped in the water to escape or take their lives. But most were tied up and put in trucks. By 1959, a national uprising against the occupying forces would result in the deaths of thousands of Tibetans. Kensei Rinpoche realized that his commitment to teach the Dharma was no longer possible in his homeland. Leaving everything behind, including his precious books and most of his own writings, Kensei Rinpoche and his family fled Tibet. Traveling southwards, the group could not even make a fire for their food out of fear of being caught.
They hid during the day and resumed their escape at night with a lone moon to illuminate their journey into the unknown. After traveling for many months, Kensi Rinpoche and his family arrived as refugees in the nearby kingdom of Bhutan. In a foreign land, with nowhere to go and no one to ask for help, they made their shelter under a tree. Of course, the eventual fall of Tibet in 1959 was a devastating loss. But with Kensington Butcher life, we did not lose everything. Because in this one man, all of Tibet's Buddhist heritage was actually embodied. What was extraordinary was that he took on his glorious manifestation at the very point when Tibetan teachings were arriving in the West and spreading throughout the world. Only a few months into his arrival in Bhutan, devastating news reached Kensei Rinpoche. His beloved teacher, Kensei Chokhi Lodro, had passed away in the neighboring monarchy of Sikkim. Kensei Rinpoche immediately left for the funeral ceremony and carried out most of the duties involved with enshrining the remains of his teacher. <laughs> A memorial stupa was built on the spot where the cremation took place. Kunchak Lodro, an old student of Kensei Rinpoche, recalls those days. He was a very kind-hearted person, very gentle, and he never got angry. It is rare to find someone like him these days. No matter what people said to him, whether it was good or bad, pleasant or unpleasant, he always reacted in the same way. He would just say, I see, I see. During the break from his teachings or empowerments, Rinpoche would always sit here and pray. I would also come here and sit next to him. In 1962, Kinsey Rinpoche's younger daughter, who was studying in India at the time, fell ill. He quickly traveled to be by her side. However, after spending only a few minutes with her, she passed away. Though unfamiliar with the local language and lacking resources, Kensi Rinpoche carried her body to the bank of the Yamuna River. He spent the whole night gathering wood and preparing the funeral pyre. In the early dawn, Kensi Rinpoche cremated her himself. Having lost his daughter, his teachers, and his homeland, he wrote, A beautiful country is like a dream, like illusion. It is senseless to cling to it. Unless the inner forces of negative emotions are conquered, strife without enemies will never end. In Bhutan, the queen invited Kensei Rinpoche to teach at Simtoka Dzong, a centuries-old fortress that contained a school. During the day, he would teach grammar and handwriting. During the evenings and weekends, he would give Dharma teachings to anyone who requested them. One day, the queen of Bhutan visited Rinpoche with her small child, the future king, his majesty, Jigme Sangye Wanchuk. It was the first of many times that they would meet as teacher and patron. In 
1962, Rinpoche visited the holy place of Namo Buddha Mountain, where in a previous life, the Buddha had offered his body to feed a starving tigress on the verge of eating her cubs. That night, he had a vision in which he climbed to the summit and met his late teacher, Chechen Gyaltsab, along with two of his other teachers, Chechen Rabjam and Chechen Kantrul. Seeing Rabjam and Kantrul with his late teacher, he understood that they had passed away in prison and cried out, The Buddha Dharma has faded. You have been killed by the communists. The happiness for beings is gone. The three masters answered in unison, serve sentient beings and the Buddha Dharma. By doing so, there will be immense benefit. The combined blessings of the three of us will take birth in your bloodline to serve the Dharma and all beings. Later, news reached Rinpoche that his teachers had indeed passed away in prison. In 1967, Rinpoche's daughter gave birth to a son who was recognized as Rabjam Rinpoche, the combined reincarnation of the three Sheshan masters. Kense Rinpoche himself raised his grandson and spiritual heir from the age of five. I myself, when I was very young, I loved Rinpoche very much, like my grandfather. I could see him as, as like my grandfather. I don't know much about the um, qualities of the spiritual master and all this. But I just, you know, hanging around, playing with Rinpoche. And Rinpoche also, whenever he gets time, he makes drawings for me. You know, he's a very good artist. He makes like flower drawings and he would draw like butterfly and he would draw like rabbit. Rabbit is one of his favorite um, because also his name is Rapsal Dawa. It's like a brilliant moon. Sometimes when Rinpoche gives this uh, any empowerments, big empowerments, and I used to sit next to Rinpoche, very small, and then I would ask Rinpoche to give a small piece of the Tsampa. And usually these are like a, a sacred objects, you don't play with them, but Rinpoche is so kind to he would take a small piece of Dharma and give it to me, so I can just sit next to it and make uh, some toys and all these kind of things. Those are like my kind of childhood memories with Rinpoche. To accommodate Rinpoche's family, her Majesty the Queen offered Kensei Rinpoche a house in Bhutan. This house was Rinpoche's first permanent residence since fleeing Tibet. From that base, he traveled constantly to India and Nepal, giving teachings and empowerments to an ever-growing number of students. In Nepal, thousands of monks, nuns, and lay people descended into the Kathmandu Valley to hear him recite the entire collection of the Tripitaka, the words of the Buddha. Quickly recognized as one of the great teachers of the time, dozens of monasteries' brightest young lamas came to study under Kensi Rinpoche many who would go on to expound the Dharma not only for the exiled Tibetan community, but for the growing audience of interested practitioners all around the world. To be a good spiritual Lama or a master is one thing, but to be a good human being, you know, good, you know, soothing, um, trustworthy, someone who would not judge us, someone who can be anything, friend, father, brother, someone who would be, who is ready to be one of you, you know, like, just mingle with you in your really mundane conversations. No, of course, someone who can switch, 
into someone who, who gives you uh, advice on a worldly matters, uh, life management. I have met many great masters, I must say, I'm very fortunate. But not all the masters are that easy going. So this is where I have to say, such a unique quality. He is, of course, as we all know, a great master. But he was a, he was a good human being. Kensi Rinpoche was close with many of the great meditation masters of his time. They not only exchanged their knowledge of rare texts, but they also had the time to share jokes. In 1980, during a two-week retreat at Tiger's Nest in Bhutan, Rinpoche had a vision of the great 18th century master Jigme Lingpa. In this vision, Jigme Lingpa blessed him as the lineage holder of the heart essence tradition, the innermost secret teachings of the great perfection. Under Kensei Rinpoche's guidance, an immense number of teachings, empowerments, and reading transmissions were made available to the Bhutanese people. Upon reflecting on Kensei Rinpoche's impact on her country, the Queen Mother wrote, because the great masters of Tibet were forced to escape their homeland, Dilgo Kensei came to live in the medicinal valleys of Bhutan. He came to our country through the power of past karma and prayers and protected Bhutan with his unceasing blessings. It's extremely precious just to receive a few words of teachings from Kensei Moshe, because even something very simple, like if he tells you, be compassionate or reduce your attachments, even those very simple words, which we have heard so many times, when we hear them from someone like him, it's so obviously the expression of truth. It makes such a deep expression in our mind. It seems that we never heard those words and suddenly we start to realize that this is how things are. And that makes one understand why a spiritual teacher is so important. <laughs> Rinpoche had over 60 teachers from all the four schools of Tibetan Buddhism. <coughs> in a true spirit of a non-sectarian master, Kensi Rinpoche, even in his 70s and 80s, would request teachings that he had not yet received to preserve Tibet's spiritual heritage. Here, he receives an oral transmission from Jamgang Kongtrul Rinpoche. So Kenzi Rinpoche is very, very concerned about the other lineages also in Tibetan Buddhist school. Uh, some lineages, Rinpoche would say that, oh, this lineage has been broken. One time we had this uh, one very, very uh, clumsy looking monk came in to see Rinpoche. And since there's uh, so many other important lamas were there, so we made this monk wait for quite some time. And then after the lamas went, and I said, this monk can go in. So he went inside. Uh, then, after a long time, this monk was never coming out. 
So we said, what is he doing? You know, we went inside and Rinpoche was receiving teaching from <laughs> this humble monk. And that was like Rinpoche was uh, almost 78, 79, end of his, uh, near end of his life. He was still constantly receiving, receiving teachings and all this kind of thing. Rinpoche made sure that he was accessible to anyone wanting to meet him. He always said to his attendants, whoever comes to see me comes in the hope of receiving some benefit, so don't stop them from seeing me. In 1976, Rinpoche's work for the welfare of others took him to Europe and North America. All those who encountered him felt the embrace of his compassion and love. One thing that struck me in the beginning, um, often I didn't know what he was saying because there wasn't a translator, but when he, his speech was unceasing when he was teaching. For example, you know, when he's teaching, when he, he would breathe in, he keeps speaking. And then when he breathed out, he was speaking as he breathed out. I've never seen that before. Um, it was like this un, there wasn't a moment that he wasn't somehow engaged in some kind of compassionate activity. <laughs> Number <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
Constitución. Tener un valle en el hato de mi tope, quiero que coño, tú son la tente, la unión, la tasa, la unión. After decades of complete isolation, Tibet was made accessible by the Chinese government. In 1985, Rinpoche made his first trip to Tibet after almost 30 years of exile. Though he was 75 years old, he visited every monastery to which he was invited. Apart from the joy of seeing his homeland and lost friends again, Rinpoche had another mission to accomplish. He wished to give teachings, empowerments, and reading transmissions to the Tibetans, all of whom had been denied their spiritual heritage for many years. In 1988 and 1990, Rinpoche made two more trips to Tibet to continue his mission. In consultation with the Chinese government, he undertook the immense responsibility of rebuilding monasteries without bias as to the school or sect. It was due to Kensei Rinpoche's relentless efforts that Samye, Tibet's most important monastery, was restored to the glory it had enjoyed during the 8th century. Kenston Butch had a gift for making you feel special, as if you were the most important person he had met all day. He was effusive with his affection. He would just take your head with his huge hand and draw you next to his cheek. He would speak for at least 20 minutes, and then 
the translation took place and he would rest. When he got older, he would take a nap. Then without any prompting, he would just wake up exactly the same time, resume exactly where he'd left off half an hour earlier and continue to teach without the slightest fluctuation or hesitation. I sometimes think that Dingo Kenstrom's greatest contribution, besides all his tremendous achievement, was the simple fact that he came and lived and taught in our time. An enlightened being actually manifested here, and we were fortunate enough to witness it. In the Kathmandu Valley, Kensi Rinpoche consecrated a plot of land next to the holy stupa of Bodha, and in 1980 established Chechen Monastery as a place where the lineage and wisdom of the Buddhist teachings could be preserved and practiced. There's simply not a single defect you can find in whatever it thinks, whatever it does, whatever it says. So that gives you a complete confidence that this is someone who can truly show you how to use your human life. Also, what is uh, extremely striking is that at no point Whenever he helps his disciple, you can never have the, the slightest doubt that he kind of gets any benefit himself. The philosophy and practice of Tibetan Buddhism has been historically preserved in the immense libraries of Tibet's great monasteries. With the destruction of these institutions during the Cultural Revolution, Kensi Rinpoche ensured the survival of many of these rare texts for future generations by collecting and publishing over 400 volumes of books. <laughs> In Vajrayana Buddhism, there is a tradition of discovering sacred treasure teachings through visions. Kinsi Rinpoche, known as a great treasure revealer, taught many of his visionary teachings to his students around the world. As an author, whether he was on a flight or in his private chamber, he composed numerous poems, meditation texts, and commentaries. His writings fill 25 volumes in more than 10,000 pages. Throughout his life, Kensi Rinpoche's singular focus was the path to freedom and how to communicate that to others. Kensi Rinpoche's teaching and his life were one. The Buddha explained in very detail the uh, those I'm having the qualities of the gurus. So I uh, see I found um, in him you see, those I see, the the very good qualities. You see, he uh, great practitioner, as well as great scholar, and and particularly. You see, his basic, basic, how to say, the belief or basic attitude is the non-sectarian, which I very much appreciate. From arriving as a refugee to becoming the spiritual advisor to the royal family of Bhutan and the teacher to His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Kensi Rinpoche's life saw many changes. 
yet his behavior always remained the same. From the influential disciple to the beggar outside the monastery, all of his students deeply felt they had a special place in his heart. In 1991, Kensi Rinpoche was obliged to cancel a fourth trip to Tibet. He told one of his students, I still have much work to do, but this composite body of mine is not keeping up with me. Instead, he chose to spend three and a half months in retreat in Bhutan. During this retreat, Rinpoche asked his closest disciples to visit him. It was here in his hermitage that he gave them teachings and told them that if they had any questions, now would be a good time to ask. When Kensei Rinpoche was in silent retreat in the king of Bhutan's private residence, I went to see him. He put both his hands on my head and recited several prayers including an aspiration for students and their teachers to never be apart from each other. Taking both his palms together, he broke his silence and said, now you can go. Normally, he would never break his silence, so I thought that maybe this is not a good sign. But there was nothing much I could say, so I requested him to have a long life. He said, no problem. That was the last time we spoke. After completing the retreat, Kensei Rinpoche visited the site where his new house was being built. To a disciple, he jokingly said, An old man like me, who is about to die, is building a house to live in. Isn't it ironic? In 1991, Kensi Rinpoche conducted the yearly prayer ceremony requested by the Queen Mother for the welfare of her country and for world peace. A few hours into the ceremony, Kensi Rinpoche fell ill. On the final day of the prayer, at his disciples' urging, Kensi Rinpoche was rushed to the hospital. In the early hours of the next day, Kensi Rinpoche passed away. A few days later, His Holiness the Dalai Lama wrote this prayer. The more helpless beings are, the more it is your true nature to love them. Therefore, to ripen and liberate all beings in this dark age, reveal swiftly the moon-like face of your emanation. A year after his passing, in November 1992, Rinpoche's cremation took place in Bhutan. Dignitaries, including the royal family of Bhutan, teachers and scholars from the various traditions, came to pay their respects and gratitude. Representatives of the four schools of Tibetan Buddhism, along with the Jay Kempo, the chief abbot of Bhutan, presided over the cremation.
After Rinpoche passed away, this is the most important thing is to find the true reincarnation of Kyanza Rinpoche. So, since Rinpoche told us many times to go for Trishi Rinpoche, so we asked for Trishi Rinpoche to find the reincarnation of Kyanza Rinpoche. All around the world, Kensei Rinpoche's students eagerly waited for his return. After a few years, Chulshik Rinpoche had a vision that revealed the year of the child's birth, the names of his parents, and the place where he could be found. The Yangtze, or reincarnation of Kensei Rinpoche, was born in 1993 into the noble family of the Songsars, the descendants of the great treasure revealer Chogyur Lingpa. Under the care of Rabjam Rinpoche, the Yangtze's upbringing took place. In December 1996, Kinsei Yangtze's enthronement took place at Cheshen Monastery in Nepal. All of those who were connected with Kensei Rinpoche came to participate in this joyous event. We are quite fortunate to see him, to receive his teaching. So therefore, now it is very essential to implement his teaching in daily life so that we will be a good disciple of good Lama. So that's very important. The young Kensei Rinpoche resides in the same house in Bhutan that was under construction just before his predecessor passed away. Kensei Rinpoche still lives in the heart of all his students.
See you.